Welcome to a new interview of the Benchem and CIL initiative. In front of me I have Artur Tiedemann. Welcome. Hi Ben. Thank you for coming. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. A lot of interesting <laughs> stories I expect. <laughs> Uh, can you uh, introduce yourself uh, in a short way? Yeah, also, I'm uh, Arthur Taiman. I've been in uh, China now since 2005. Yeah. Uh, I'm working in uh, design and uh, product uh, realization uh, with a company called Orange Creatives. We, we've been doing that since 2007 um, and doing pretty well. We nice. A, yeah. And you live here in Guangzhou, right? Yeah, I live here with my wife and two kids. Uh, in Guangzhou, yeah. 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 Okay. And before also? Uh... Yeah, I started in Chi when I moved to China, I uh, lived first in uh, Wuxi, it's a second tier city in the vicinity of Shanghai, mm -hmm. in the Jiangsu province. Yeah. Okay, nice. So uh, how did you end up here? What was the reason you moved to China? Well, I was, I was in the final stages of my um, uh, studies in uh, Eindhoven. I studied uh, industrial engineering or technisch bedrijfskunde, as it's called in the uh, Netherlands. Um, and a few um, student mates that I had were starting a, a business, or actually they started it a couple of years before, which was uh, a business in, uh, they had a new product, which uh, was a greeting card with lights and sound in it, uh, microelectronics. Mm. And obviously they were going to manufacture it in uh, China. And then they made the ill-advised decision to do that in a joint venture structure at that time. So this is, was 2003 to 2004. Um, and started to lose uh, quite a lot of money, or money started to end up missing. Okay. <laughs> so that wasn't very good. Okay. So in 2005, um, they, by that time they grew very fast. It was uh, Hallmark uh, USA, okay. the biggest card manufacturer or uh, the publisher in the world. I yeah. uh, was very interested to have their product. It was new. So uh, we had to grow really fast. And they called me, do you want to go uh, to China? We want to um, start our own factory. Um, and in basically overnight, get the production capacity from the joint venture, which they would collapse yeah. into the new factory. Challenging, yeah. <laughs> but a fun first assignment uh, yeah. as a student still. Yeah. So I went there with uh, another uh, Dutch guy who uh, would end up be the general manager there uh, to set up a new factory. That's, uh, that's my first uh, thing in China, where my focus was on supply chain management and building the team there. Yeah. So purchasing, quality control, everything and uh, whole manufacturing. It was, uh, we grew and from zero to 1,000 staff or, and workers uh, in one and a half years. In one and a half years? <laughs> As a student. Insane, insane <laughs> cowboy story. Yeah. Yeah. With a good learning lot, curve though. Very good learning yeah. and a very interesting experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot of fun. I can understand, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, like you, you went, went all overnight uh, to China, in fact? So what, what, much, what, yeah. what kept you here in China then until now? Because it's, it's quite a long time already, right? Yeah, so the, my first assignment would have been six months. Uh, well, landing there, that obviously turned out, yeah, that, that, that was not, not really good, feasible. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, I signed up for a year. Uh, after that, and then I kept extending that a little bit for until I reached two and a half years. Um, by that time, I met uh, my colleague Bauke, yeah. uh, uh, who was first working for that same company in the Netherlands, and then moved to China. And we found something that we thought mm, there's a big opportunity here for uh, some some kind of business mm -hmm. that we're. We have competence in, right? Yeah. Um, and that, that's how uh, our, our company got started okay. in the end. Yeah. So the business kept you a bit in China, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, I, I really enjoyed working in China to begin with. It was yeah. usually challenging, yeah. uh, the manufacturing also with, uh, well, we, in some points we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Yeah. And also a huge growing problems, right? Yeah. So to get from zero to 1,000 people it, is challenging. To do that in China in the second tier city uh, with all the 
as a foreigner, as a foreigner with no experience whatsoever in Asia, yeah. was was very challenging. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. So after that, uh, I didn't get tired of it. I got more excited and okay. ended up doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay. Nice. So personal interests and business-wise, right? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so the business uh, you ended up with, uh, together with Bauke, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so tell us about the business, what, what, what is it doing? Yeah, so um, Bauke, in, uh, in uh, a company we used to work together, uh, was in charge of project management and she was an industrial designer from trade. She graduated from Delft University. I was really in the supply chain area of, of field and we, we felt, oh, there's an interesting overlap. Then uh, we got in touch with some people in the south and Bauke with her then her husband decided to move to the south and leave that company. I was still working in uh, Wuxi at that time. Mm. But we kept in touch and uh, we decided to start that company together uh, where we saw the opportunity and the, the, the business case for us was uh, to bring later stage design projects to China yeah. and push them into manufacturing and help, help basically overseas, mainly Dutch clients to get products realized and manufactured in China and yeah. doing all the uh, consecutive supply chain services attached to it. And that's also where our um, touch point was. Right? Yeah. Uh, I was more skilled in the supply up. chain uh, services and she was really in the design. And that expanded. Then a little bit later on, the Canton Fair, uh, we began in, got in touch with uh, uh, some people uh, in the Canton Fair itself, and they, they were considering a, a product development center, uh, it's called the PDC, yeah. uh, and we thought it was hugely interesting. As, you, as we saw Guangdong to be this area of you know, the most factory intense area in the world, right? There's yeah. a huge amount of people, a huge amount of factories yeah. that all produce stuff for mainly export. Yeah. Um, at that time it was going really well, but one of the things you saw was costs going really up very rapidly, 15% wage increases per year, um, and the currency, of course, uh, uh, increasing in value. Yeah. Uh, all that put downward pressure on uh, margins in those OEM factories, yeah. mainly. And that for us looked like there was an opportunity. And all those factories would have to do something about uh, changing their, their business right? model yeah. or, or die. Right? Yeah. Um, and there's a few ways out of it. Either can scale up to be the biggest OEM manufacturer in the world. Well, we know who that is. Yeah. Uh, they make your iPhone, right? Yeah. Or uh, you specialize and become an own brand or have a very interesting uh, innovative product. Yeah. Well, in that category, we saw, oh, they will need uh, some competent people there to help them with yeah. that. and um, that turned out to be a good bet. So right now, uh, in the first five years of operation, we had virtually no Chinese business. Now 60% of our yeah. client base is, is Chinese. Yeah. And so that, that's that's still growing. Yeah. yeah. Now you see 60% of of, of uh, having Chinese clients uh, for product design. So yeah. actually they they caught up with the development, right? That, that, that they need to do oh, something yeah. and need to protect their own yeah. uh, be benefits, in fact. Yeah, yeah. And so, so we feel we are only at the start of that, uh, uh, well, service industry in general, yeah. but uh, design, branding, and these type of services in particular. Yeah. And there's, um, there's uh, still a long way to go before you see... Uh, the end of the tunnel. Uh, yeah. Uh, and. and made in China as being a high value brand in itself, yeah. right? It's still all over the world made in China means low cost products. And that's, that takes time and a lot of effort to change it. But it should change if you want to go it must. Yeah, it, it must, must. Yeah. yeah. Very well, very well. The alternative is not very exciting for yeah, yeah. If it would be <laughs> an alternative. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, it's already for quite a, a lot of years, right? So. To start off, like, what are your, in your eyes, the pros and cons of operating a business in China? As a as a businessman working in China, I think the biggest pros are 
still there's a lot of opportunity like I just explained for a company like like ours uh, also we, we get really big support from the Chinese government actually yeah. um, to, to be here because they, they see the same thing that we see they need to innovate and yeah. you need to become have strong brands they need to have um, uh, good product design good branding um, yeah. and then that that's where we can play a key uh, role. What I also find ex exciting uh, myself is to see uh, what overlap there is still is between uh, well our Western experience and and the Chinese. I think there's there's to use a Chinese phrase a win-win possibility yeah. there, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not just low cost manufacturing. You know, there's there's more to it. There's an approach of pra pragma pragmatism in in China that. I think is is uh, is interesting. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Also, there on a personal level, the pros, right? Yeah, this is the okay. super. What would be cons? Cons, yeah. There, there's a, of course some obvious cons. Uh, that stuff is really different, right? So you will run into difficulties by just being different. Um, and also, how hard you try, you always stay an obvious foreigner. I will not become uh, a part of Chinese society in the sense that uh, uh, you would become, for instance, American when you move to America. Yeah. Right? That's you will never become a real Chinese. No, or and that has it has its limitation uh, limitations and its risks also. Right? You never know exactly um, will we still be welcome here in yeah. a few years to come, and will there still be the same opportunity or? Yeah. Um, or not, uh, yeah. right? So that that's that's sort of a con. Another con is that there's difficulties here uh, that I think uh, are specific to to the stage in development of China. Yeah. And so finding uh, the right skilled uh, workforce, ma maintaining a certain quality level, experiences that with factories uh, that, that that are tough to deal with. Just just having. Uh, batches of poor quality to to outright scams. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you, you yeah. you've met met them Tell all. Tell me something. <laughs> and, and these are definite cons and things that you need to be uh, yeah. quite aware of. Yeah, but there are a little bit cons which are actually part of the economic stage, or maybe it's it's related to China. Either way, it are cons. Fact, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, it's something that's definitely you will. Uh, find out when doing business in or with China. Yeah. Uh, you will have this uh, this situation where you you will ha find difficulties because you are different. So um, does your different point of view as a foreigner creates conflicts uh, in certain situations uh, here? Of course, you have some cons, maybe in, in different opinions or maybe different point of views. But what kind of conflicts that you that can you can you name that you say like okay? Here we really feel I'm different, or I see things differently than uh, the local Chinese. For example, on quality level, you said, yeah. uh, what would be the aim of, 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 of how a Chinese factory would look at the quality, and how would you uh, look at the quality from your company point of view? Point of view? Yeah, well, um, to give an re a recent example, the strength of uh, non-disclosure agreements and, and a protection of intellectual property, right? We are yeah. always dealing with that because all our stuff is new right? and we're doing something new for a client that is very uh, scared to, to, to uh, put their idea out there in China. Our reputation hinges a lot on um, uh, having the credibility to be able to protect their idea well. There, there's a, um, a mismatch in how important that is for us and what it means to put a, a signature on a non-disclosure agreement and how that is perceived in in China, and that that uh, that needs constant vigilance, and there there's a, there's a conflict there. Okay. So where where for it's also also with my colleagues, for instance, where they say, yeah, I found this good factory that might be able to help us uh, with this particular component, and boof, there goes a whole 3D model of a product to to that spire. worldwide world, yeah. Right. Uh, if you if you're not careful, that that it will exactly ha happen. Uh, so you need to be very vigilant. I, I think there's a different way that uh, intellectual property is perceived in a large area, also of Guangdong actually. Yeah. Uh, in Shenzhen there's this whole ecosystem where the neighbor does basically a version of the product that you just finished and they still seem to not 
care or um, not as much uh, not suing each probably. other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, of course, it, it will cap the the limit of, of the success you can have on a product. Yeah. Um, so that's a conflict, basically, right? Yeah, and uh, a threat to doing business in, in China. Yeah. As well. and, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, constantly yeah. end up being. You need to explain that. Yeah. Why that is important. To yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know it by myself. I experienced it by yeah. myself with yeah. NDA. So yeah, what is the NDA worth? Uh, especially if you, yeah. you you have to deal with new product designs and IPs, as you said. So yeah, then this NDA becomes even more uh, important. Uh, it's not like a little part what you have changed in a product, right? It's like the whole thing. It's an idea yeah. mostly that people slept over on, on, overnight, yeah. right? So yeah. No, indeed. Um, okay, that is so. So you said also your workers are not really uh, having the point of view on the NDA that you would have, but but like. Um, well, my my colleagues are by now very well trained, but yeah. um, more like they would have a Chinese is, view on it. You need to explain it. Yeah. Uh, where I think um, culturally, um, someone from, from the Netherlands would uh, recognize the strength of that document and would. Yeah. would by nature be more careful where yeah. where to put it and also yeah. put more of a value on it right i had a, yeah. another interview with uh, uh, with someone out of the ip industry and also there uh, was said that even at their office where they are enforcing counterfeiting yeah and um, that the, the the workers don't always see the need uh, because they find copy products actually quite convenient because they are cheaper so yeah um this is this is has nothing to do uh, of course um, 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 yeah I'd say business wise it is in the culture and therefore yeah. an explanation a good training therefore is very yeah. important and uh, yeah and it, it, it's an interesting uh, uh, point of view right so if you have an ecosystem like like for instance you have in particular areas of Shenzhen where you have exactly the same product being produced in many many places huh? yeah. and um, that it's different, a very different approach. So there's a very rapid innovation on slight ideas of the product, right? Yeah. But not, not big scale innovation like like we we would like to do yeah. on a new product. Um, it's a very different approach. Yeah. Um, and will that will that go away? Will that develop to a certain uh, environment <laughs> that we will eventually think like, well, we are over this period now? Well. I think when you have, uh, I think there is something to be said for that ecosystem, right? And um, I th do think there's limitations. Uh, there's this, it's very unlikely that there's a revolutionary new innovation coming out of that system because there's there's no innovation. There's, there, there's no the risk of in investing a huge amount in something uh, revolutionary uh, will, will be too high. Yeah. The neighbor not immediately knows, right? Yeah. Probably it has some uses on, on um, highly commoditized products, yeah. right? And they're, they're basically yeah, the fast earners. Yeah, yeah the, 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 where there's not so much innovation going on, and a lot of it's a slight incremental change to a product. Yeah. I think there there is probably the right, right way. Yeah. The other side of the coin is, of course, uh, the over-reliance on IP, right? So patenting, we did a lot of stuff in the toy industry in the US. Therefore, every every small little thing that changes to a product, there there will be a patent filed. I think that, that defeats the purpose as well. So yeah. uh, probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. Where? <laughs> Personal opinion, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, product design, engineering. Um, to go to that subject. Um, so what makes a company like you, uh, a Dutch company, right? Or at least uh, a Dutch managed and uh, created. What does it uh, make it more able or skilled uh, compared to a local Chinese design company? Okay, so one thing I think the Dutch approach, the, the comprehensive approach to design uh, is, is quite different from what, what the locals uh, do. And it starts with education. So uh, in, an industrial designer that graduated in the Netherlands is, is an engineer by trade, is an engineering degree. In um, China it's, it's much more segmented. So you have people from art school who are designers. Um, they have very little affinity with technology or uh, manufacturing processes. And then you have engineers. 
what you see a lot in factories that the engineers are pretty much in charge of designs. It reflects a lot in how products from China tend to look and work. Yeah. And the, the, they have the user somewhere in mind, but it's not the primary focus. Where for a Dutch designer, that will be definitely the primary focus. Yeah. So the, how we use that to our advantage is to work with um, usually a Dutch or a Western schooled industrial designer and in, the, in his team, there will be Chinese engineers who are very good in doing, for instance, mechanical design. Uh, and and uh, Chinese uh, designers that have a more aesthetic, are more first in the sketching. And that, that team creates huge benefits because then, then you can holistically design a product yeah. um, with the user uh, as a central Aim. Aim, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, in fact, you're saying like um, to create uh, the best mix is to 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 take the best of both sides, right? And make a mixture which is eventually yeah. uh, getting best from both worlds. Yeah. Okay. And and um, for example, the expectations are there differences in in expectations because you say like uh, we we Dutch uh, people are are quite well educated with the user user in aim. Um, USA slightly the same, um, maybe a little bit different, but I think more similar, right? Um, so that also creates, as a person, as a, as, a, as a client, a different expectation of a design. So, yeah. what is the difference of the of, of, of an expectation of a design Chinese compared to Europeans, for example? Difference in projects we do are are, are quite vast, okay. right? So uh, in China we work uh, usually with most of our client base is manufacturers right? so they're they're looking for uh, what we call styling or outer shape design and sometimes packaging and sometimes some branding questions in, into it but we do very little to the inner uh, engineering and functioning because of the product. Because that's where the engineers that, that's their strength, what they do. right? So yeah. basically we, we make a shell around the product. Okay. And in, for overseas clients uh, US, US clients, uh, Middle East, uh, Europe, almost a direct opposite, where they already have a good idea on what the concept of the product is and what the styling of the product is, they, uh, they need to be able to make it. Yeah. So we're, we're really working on the engineering and realizing it uh, for, for the price point they have in mind, for the use case they have in mind. Yeah. It's, it's a very different, uh, different approach. So expectation obviously is also very different. Yeah, but uh, indeed. So in this case, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you need to create an idea instead yeah. of a uh, shell. Then, uh, so if you compare the, the same uh, starting point, um, I think Chinese clients usually are less well oriented in what their market actually is, right? Who, 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 who are they making the product for? It's hard for them to really make a good brief for, for the designer. Okay, we are gonna focus on, on these, this segment of the users um, and they like uh, roughly these, these things. Uh, and that fit, fits well with our branding, for instance. It's more hit and miss. So they will say, uh, you as a designer, you, de you decide, yeah. you know best. Yeah. Right? Where uh, overseas, uh, client usually has a much better grasp of who his target audience is, uh, who, who, who is he making the yeah. product for, um, and uh, what price point is it going to be? Um, what can you earn? What did they right. need to earn? What they so the, the, for? Usually the input from a Western client, the complete design brief is better uh, overseas than, than it is in China. Quite, quite basic and they leave yeah. too much freedom to the designer, which uh, seems like a good idea, yeah. but finally um, will make decisions harder. True, so they, yeah. would a, a difference or a expectation be like that the Chinese um, the Chinese client would more think like, okay, I don't care, but you need to create a product or yeah. a shell uh, mostly that right. would fit the biggest market and get me the best result in numbers, so in profits? Yeah, so usually if you prod a little bit on uh, and uh, find out, do a bit of research on where uh, this client is actually selling its, its, its products. Yeah. Often they don't know eh, because there's a distributor in between and mm. uh, they, they don't know, they don't understand really the stores that their products are finding in. Okay. And that, well, that's already a big... That makes, <laughs> makes it quite difficult. <laughs> it yeah. makes it difficult. <laughs> um, 
And so yeah, there, there you need to do some uh, research yeah. and more digging. What, what is? Uh, yeah, it makes it more challenging, right? Yeah. Uh, also, like, is it going to work or not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So our approach there is that we um, we we really try to funnel the client towards a design that uh, he end up liking and, and will actually work for his for his market yeah okay. yeah that would be the most efficient right hmm. uh, knowing your customer is yeah. a base to sell something so yeah, yeah. Uh, no indeed okay now yeah, to to create a product design into a physical product we're going to the product development of course mm -hmm. um, now you have a big background in supply chain so uh, no one have to tell you how to uh, develop a product in china <laughs> Um, so can you take us in a summarized tour about the process? Like, of course, it's a big process and many, many uh, stations are passed. But yeah. Um, yeah, from where do we start and where do we end regarding the production or the product development? What is a reasonable investment you are willing to make for the product you're going to make? Um, what would be cool. reasonable? Cool. Well, compared to what you're uh, planning to sell, right? Yeah. If, if you, you're going to sell uh, a few thousand units, it makes no sense to come up with a brilliant new new thing for something if the market size is only that for you. Uh, the beginning of a project is all about um, uh, making those expectations uh, reasonable. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we simply advise use something that's already there and uh, tweak the appearance a little bit and uh, that's probably better fit, better match uh, for your specific demand than uh, creating something completely new. Yeah. Everybody wants to create something completely new and innovative. Yeah, but well, it must be also possible, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. so that would be step one, right? To define yeah. like if something is possible, what you have in mind, and how can you create it eventually that it is possible. So instead of just right. developing some part fully new, just yeah. use something as system. And eventually prototypes are made mostly with like hands, right? Like, um, it's not like it is already a directly a mold open, or how do no. you see that? No, so we can do um, a lot before uh, the big costs of a design pro project are made, which is the investment in, in molds, that's right. So before we open molds, we want to know exactly what the product will cost. Oh. Right? And we want to know exactly how the product will work. Will we proceed? <laughs> yeah, so before, long before we open molds, there's um, several uh, steps where we have go no go decisions yeah. uh, or we have we can change direction right um, and these these are usually uh, where, where you can test stuff so the first thing we usually do is make make very rough mock-ups and it can be with paper laser cutting we have 3d printers in our office as well where we make uh, skill models uh, or full-size models where we can test how does a product feel in the hand, uh, what's the angle to your user, ergonomics is important. Uh, of course, vi visually it should represent well, uh, it should look exactly like yeah. uh, it looks on, on a flat screen, and it's not always the case. Uh, 3D is still something, something slightly different. Um, from there we make an actual prototype like that it looks like you will find it in the store. And then there's a final decision. Now, now we like it. The price point is good. Uh, functionality is good. Invest go, in the molds. Go, go, go for the molds. Okay. Yeah. And then the production process starts, right? And then so, um, the then you probably will have also a sampling process. Yeah. So um, normally, the longest time needed in that process, when you go to production setup. Um, we it's the opening of the injection molds. In the meantime, what you do is with usually a prototype runs you uh, design the assembly steps with the assembly factory. So to to basically you're going to sit down with the assembly factory like okay how are we gonna um, uh, make the production process for this product? So from step yeah. one, station one, two, three, yeah. four, five, right? Of course, you already evaluated the basic uh, uh, production process and assembly. Um, good enough to have a price, yeah. but now it's going yeah, to actually yeah. happen. So you also need to check, okay, where where are the risks, uh, where we s still feel um, we need intermediate testing, and uh, that's that's a very important part. Uh, so the in-house testing you do and the third-party testing, um, all those uh, cycles will give you 
additional data and that makes your risk analysis uh, better. Okay, so eventually now production, uh, all the risks are eventually uh, got out of the process, so that means we have a useful product afterwards, right? Um, Hopefully, yeah. So we talked <laughs> already a bit uh, before uh, we started uh, the interview, of course. Um, what we were talking about was that there is a big part uh, which is uh, from your process, from the design process or the production process mm -hmm. eventually, that um, there is a different moment of that overseas clients go to China to start uh, these kind of processes while um, they should go earlier. Can you explain uh, what you... Uh, yeah, so look, if, if imagine yourself being in the Netherlands or wherever and you have a great new product idea. Your first go-to is not China, right? You want to find somebody close that is a good designer and that will help you design a product. You want to basically sit face to face and work out that product idea. Totally understandable and a very good idea. Uh, that's also why we pay more attention now to our target markets in uh, Europe. So we're now also in the Netherlands and in the US. Um, why? Because we want to bring designs earlier to China. Uh, what, what wastes a lot of time and money is when a design goes to China, then you find out, oh crap, we need to do 30% of the design again because it, it really doesn't fit uh, the, the, the manufacturing. Uh, or the Chinese uh, engineer. Yeah. Or the Chinese engineers. or, or um, there's, there's other big price concerns we, we didn't think of in the Netherlands. And you cannot think of it in the Netherlands or in, in the US, USA for that matter, because there is no way you can um, establish a good grasp on the final manufacturing process of the product. Not it's the, simply not there. No, no, it's not sufficient. Indeed. No. Uh, so that, that, and also um, local designers in, in uh, the Netherlands would not have that experience. Yeah. Um, so, what I would recommend, uh, go ahead and work with a designer in the Netherlands. Uh, I totally understand it for a new product, but make sure that they consult uh, someone in China, could be us, uh, to at least have a benchmark on uh, how that thing is manufactured. Yeah. And not when the design is finished, but when you start the design. Yeah, so basically you're saying like, yeah, um, don't waste time. Um, actually, if you want to develop a product in China, design it in China uh, because yeah. it will save you a lot of, um, a lot of money, yeah. uh, probably also costs and a lot of considerations of changing things in your design or... Yeah, yeah. and but changes, changes are, are just bloody expensive. And yeah, because it's something cannot fit suddenly or... Yeah. And, and it costs a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, in general, the, the whole design process is uh, grossly underestimated in time by clients. That's... Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they think... Uh, Common scene. <laughs> you just draw something, uh, open molds and, and yeah. done. Yeah. But the, the, the whole process is long. Yeah. And if you then uh, find out that after you finish the design, you think, ah, I'm ready to open molds. Yeah. And then you find out you need to do 20, 30% again. Yeah. That's really frustrating. And it's uh, usually the money is finished by the time. Then if you don't want to go to China, there should be, in, 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 uh, there should be some knowledge about um, having a certain understanding about how it works in China regarding uh, yeah, product engineers, manufacturing, yeah. um, to be able to work efficient, but also, of course, to have the chance on the best result, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. are there also other uh, things that you say, like if you're going to develop a product in, in, in China or you're going to develop a product in, in general, what are the uh, things that you should understand from China outside of the parts that we have already uh, uh, talked about? Are there, for example, cultural things that we need to talk about? Uh, um, yeah, having a certain experience with manufacturers is, is of course, a... Uh, yeah, you mean in respect to a design or... Um, no, in respect in general. of the process, because yeah. eventually everyone wants to end up with a real product, right? And there are... Yeah, so, um, I guess if you work on a new, new product, yeah, you need to consider a few things. Uh, one of these things is that you uh, try to work with the least amount of uh, suppliers as possible, right? So okay. if you have a huge amount of subcontractors, uh, that is, is... Not controllable. Pretty, pretty control nightmare, yeah. yeah. 
Well, one other thing I think is interesting to, to know uh, for the process when you do it in the Netherlands is there's um, um, a few innovations in uh, production that are specific, specifically made in China. Uh, for instance, a process called in-mold labeling right? mm -hmm. is very common in China um, and it's, it's relative, relatively affordable. Well, if you see comparative um, things in Europe, either they're hugely expensive or they've, through the back door, they still come from China. Yeah. Right? And there's, there's a few of these things also in electronics where um, they are really specific now to the uh, Chinese production ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, and it's very hard to know that if you're only yeah. in the Netherlands. Regarding those subjects, the knowledge is in China and yeah. therefore also the options. So uh, to consi understanding that China has these op opportunities and these possibilities if, is of, oh, yeah. of course key to, yeah. to proceed, right? Um, what kind of uh, characteristics of the Chinese way of doing business is for you key to understand to um, maybe develop your product, but also to do business? What are things that yeah. you th say like, hey, that is what others should know? Um, yeah, I, I think a, lo a lot of what you hear is, is probably still that you have to uh, do a lot of whining and dining. I think that, that definitely when I came Why to see? China, that, right? that was the case. Yeah, a uh, lot, lot through networks. Yeah. I think in my experience, especially here, it's, it's uh, changing to be way more professional than it used to be. Uh, so it's just a new generation uh, that has entered top management of, of companies. And they're way more, uh, one, they're better educated. And uh, they have a way more business approach to, to yeah. management. Uh, whereas the, the older generation uh, relied a lot on network and, uh, yeah, as they say, Guangxi. Yeah. So I think there's, there's a change happening. Still, I think um, you should be aware how uh, relations Work. are important in China different from uh, from Europe right from Europe and yeah, is there a certain to just to, to to make it a little bit more clear I compare it always with the uh, with the Google uh, we we uh, in Holland uh, we uh, tend to trust any group uh, any company who comes first or on the first page of a Google search result and here if we're going to the relationship that would never happen there should be a certain contact right and um, so the networking uh, yeah. should be in that way understand it um, yeah, I, I think um, you need to do better due diligence and, and with your key partners in China, you should have uh, a strong uh, understanding at least. And you, you understanding of what? Uh, of each other and where you're coming from and yeah. what, what makes you tick, right? Um, yeah. And that, that's not, not obvious. Okay, so to understand the... Uh, understand where you're coming from is also to be able for or the other part you need to understand where you come from and you need to understand where they come from yeah. to eventually make it able to have a profitable yeah. uh, cooperation out, right? Yeah, I mean um, how companies are organized in, uh, well, let's take for example Netherlands, it's very very straightforward, right? And it's obvious the moment you walk in the door basically that's definitely not the case in China. You need to dig a lot deeper to understand how a business operates, uh, who's actually in charge, um, and which factors play a role. Right? Yeah. And um, that, that, that's hard to find out sometimes. Huh? So, for instance, uh, how leveraged are there? Right? Right. Uh, are, are there shareholders in the company that actually have a lot of power, but you never see them? Uh, these are big, big concerns on, in the business sense, but also in the interpersonal. You, you need to consider uh, who are you dealing with, right? And, and, that's, and that's in the networking and in the relationship uh, way also. Right? Yeah, uh, that it's. Um, yeah, yeah. There's less on the surface than there is with uh, working with a, a Dutch person, and that's yeah. that's not um, obvious to to people coming here. Yeah. But can I state then, then what did you learn? Like, did you learn in China really to dig further than actually what you see? Is that a, is that a personal, uh, yeah, personal thing that you learned or business-wise also, of course, related? 
Uh, can I see in this way that you really um, learned, okay, I need to dig deeper into companies to, to, to get a better result, either way in production way, either way if I want to sell something to a company? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's definitely true. Uh, I learned to dig deeper, and I learned um, also to um, to allow a certain degree of uh, ambiguity. In Holland, we're quite direct, and we know exactly um, how how your business runs and wh why you do what you do. Right? That is, uh, in, when we do business in Holland, it's, it's quite straightforward and transparent and transparent yeah. and um, you understand uh, how a business operates and what the individual you're talking to does in that business in china it's hard especially with new contacts to know that and uh, it can be very very frustrating so you ask a straight question and you can get this <laughs> circle around answer yeah. um, and I think that's that's something. Um, if you press that hard in the beginning, uh, pro probably that's not directly going to help you much. Uh, so in the beginning, you will have to deal with some form of ambiguity, uh, things that are not clear cut, yeah. um, and patience. <laughs> patience, yeah, and learn. I mean, uh, yeah. learning from all. And uh, if it goes yeah. wrong one time, or you were. <laughs> I mean, you, you yeah. thought they meant this, and then eventually it was yeah, something that, else. That's bound to happen, of yeah. course, right? Yeah, uh, it need to happen to learn it, right? Yeah, yeah, that's bound to happen. Um, one thing you hedge yourself a little bit that that uh, misunderstandings do not turn into all our disasters, right? Uh, hedge yourself and assume uh, that it will not be okay. Good enough. So that would be yeah. advice. It's also one that I always, yeah, I would would would. <laughs> Put it in other words, but so it is like okay. Assume everything you do. Assume that it goes wrong, uh, or that it is not okay. Yeah. Then mostly you are safe with your risks, right? Right. I think so that's that's. Assume that they didn't understand you. Assume that yeah. um, you have a wrong understanding. Yeah. Um, and assume that it will not be okay. Okay. Did uh, you? And did then then you have a good yeah. footing, I think, to get things out of. Yeah, no, personally, that is also yeah, the way to go. Yeah. I learned, personally, I learned to ask double questions. And, and now I start to do it with my friends also. And sometimes I get, yeah, uh, um, yeah I'd say uh, some feedback, like, yeah, you just asked it also already. Yeah. So uh, I tend, because just to doubt that the, the other party understands or that I understand them, I just double question everything. So yeah. I don't assume that y yes is a yes and a no is a no. Uh, that is a little bit what you are pointing at, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, also, yeah, I think th there is definitely a cultural component, right? Where, for sure, uh, especially when you're dealing with a, a client supplier relationship or a superior uh, uh, subordinate relationship, um, if you expect a direct answer uh, from your Dutch background, it's, it's unlikely that you're always going to get that. Right? Yeah. So yes, a yes can mean many things yeah. and not always yes. Yeah. <laughs> it can mean sometimes the direct opposite. Yeah, and you will find out eventually. <laughs> yeah. So, right? so yeah. there, there is uh, something that um, uh, I think what you said, so reconfirming that uh, yeah. you understood correctly what they understood and that they understood you correctly by repeating back to you. Yeah. Um, Without without being condescending, yeah. uh, and then uh, that, that's uh, yeah, that would be a way forward, challenge. right? Yeah. yeah, that's a challenge. That's a, uh, just a different mindset in yeah. general. Yeah. Okay. Now, very clear. Um, just I, I ask this question to everyone, and uh, I think it's very uh, a nice question. Like uh, in all the years that you have worked here, um, with all the manufacturers that you have worked with, the clients that you had, the products that you have designed, um, did you? Um, experience a certain situation that you or an experience that you always have remembered that you say now nah, from that moment that shaped myself as a person or your business that you thought like okay now we're gonna have another another route because this route didn't end up well um building that factory in wushu i think that that was were a few formative years where we had big big issues your first years right first first years and um you go in, of course, with a lot of um, 
concept on how you want that factory to be in uh, Dutch concepts. Yeah, yeah, very Dutch concept and uh, what is a good manager and, and so on. Um, yeah, we got pretty big pushback at times, okay. uh, strikes and yeah, uh, yeah and then <laughs> suddenly uh, you end up sleeping in the factory because there's yeah. 300 angry people standing outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah these, these things um, um, Shift yourself. help you to uh, find um, a, a, a proper way of dealing with things, with, with things in China. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's... Well, yeah, I think also because it was a, the, the start period and it was a, such a big uh, yeah. project, uh, especially what you say, 300 angry people outside, you cannot <laughs> leave the factory, otherwise you would be uh, uncertain about your life, maybe. <laughs> well, no, they just locked the gate. Oh, they, they, they just I, locked I, the gate. <laughs> I saw yeah. that people turn violent, but uh, they, they yeah. Um, yeah. They could, they could have become. It's, it was a better to have a conversation than to uh, yeah. push yourself out of it. Yeah, that yeah. should shape you as a person yeah. for sure, right? And also as a businessman, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, not yeah. Sure. Okay, so, so uh, China is a market. Um, you started here and you've been through the whole process. Um, so you've made big successes. Um, yeah, are those um, successes, uh, would you have... Uh, yeah, reach those successes also in Holland, uh, in the same way that you would have done them here in China, or have China really play a key role? Of course, there was a demand here, but but um, yeah, what what could China offer to create a certain success? What Holland at that time could not offer, um, or maybe Europe, you say? Yeah, it's a little bit speculative to say that we couldn't. We we could have set up a, a company in Holland doing design or yeah, uh, for example, um, we I think. What we found, and we, we were both at that time young and adventurous, uh, so we thought it was exciting to try it, uh, is that there were not many businesses uh, or foreigners doing the same thing we were doing at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's a bit more, but I thought that was an opportunity that uh, we couldn't have had in Netherlands yeah. uh, staying there. We, we couldn't... There was no we development were, in that sector, right? Right, and there were already many design companies. And yeah. I think uh, Holland has probably the uh, <laughs> largest amount of designers per capita uh, from any place in the world. Yeah. So we would be, we would struggle to be unique. And right. that's uh, maybe interesting to do, but I think here we found that... Uh, was a gap. Uh, there yeah. was a gap, yeah. yeah. So that, that in that sense, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Was, uh, really specific to China at that time. And now I think, um, yeah, we were really at the start of uh, the service industry in China uh, doing anything, right? Before that, in the first years, nobody wanted to pay for service. It was unheard of, you didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, especially something that was not really directly tangible. So yeah. a sketch, I can get my cousin to do it for, uh, for an ice cream. Why, why mm -hmm. should I pay you? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I well, for money for it, and yeah. I think that we overcome a lot of hurdles in that uh, that road. Okay. So I think it's there have been a development in this case. Yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah. so the developments now, and now there are more Dutch design companies. I mean, the uh, Fair is also, uh, uh, yeah, is performing or showing how many Dutch uh, ideas and uh, Dutch design companies we have here. Um, so, but the market also became bigger. So, yeah. are you seeing still? The same chances, maybe in a different way, but are you still, you say it's just at the beginning, you said in the beginning of the interview, the, the whole market. Um, so from now on, I assume, just assuming that it is now still an interesting market, how would you see then development in the coming 10 years um, from China? What, what, what do you see, see happening? Yeah, so... Um I'm, I'm not an economist, so I will leave the yeah, no, potential, yeah, personal opinion, right? uh, potential crisis is a little bit aside. But personally, I think, I think we should be a little bit concerned about uh, some aspects of yeah. that. Um, where, where I'm bullish, where I, th I see great potential still is, is in service industry. Uh, mm -hmm. One, you see a lot of people want to work in service industry right now, a lot of talent available. Yeah. Um, I think that's really exciting. Uh, I think there's um, 
there will still be a great push for Chinese and made in China to become a brand in itself. Yeah. Um, there's there's a slight analogy to how Japan did that uh, in the 80s. Yeah. Right? Um, so I think there's there's a long way to go, um, and I think I would be excited to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if they yeah. will still have us here. Of course. <laughs> no, I think uh, so far I think that's um, that's definitely also from within the direction China seems to be going and where where the. Um, the aim of the, the aim of the, the the country itself. Yeah, also where the government is is, is directing resources uh, yeah. still, is in um, higher value added services. Yeah, and so they're happy that you are here, right? Yeah. So that will yeah. be indeed a, a big chance for the coming ten years. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, ten years is a is a long horizon. I think yeah, for the five the years, five years in, at least. Yeah, yeah, the times that we live in that yeah. uh, it's uh, yeah. financially uh, we will see where it goes. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, every every. Every um, yeah, everywhere are opportunities where people fall, people rise. Yeah. And, uh, China, in my opinion, China still has more tools to overcome this kind of uh, uh, difficulties. To still have a, a um, yeah. Um, yeah, to be able to say like in ten years we could be somewhere. Yeah, no, no, we're long on China still. Yeah. We're we're we're, uh, we're investing uh, basically. A lot in, in, in China to be also better uh, situated in, in the market, to yeah. understand the market better and to do more projects that directly relate to the Chinese market. Uh, yeah. Right now, still a large part of our projects are uh, export. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, that's something we hope to, uh, we hope to do mo more onshore projects. Yeah. And we have very interesting clients there, uh, startup companies mainly, yeah. that, that really create something new. Yeah. Um, um, and I'm really excited to work on that. Um, damn, damn smart people uh, around. Yeah, um, no, I believe so. Great ideas. I believe yeah. so. Great. Now, Arthur, I want to thank you for uh, for your uh, knowledge, sharing your experience here. Most welcome. Most, uh, my and, pleasure. Uh, hope to yeah. see you again soon. Thank Thanks, you. Ben. Have a great one. Cheers. <laughs>